Hey, you lovely lot, and welcome back to Crime Analyst YouTube channel and The Intelligence Cell. And I'm really pleased to be back. I did go away to New York for a short trip to celebrate my little guy's second birthday and to go to the tennis. And I also went to the Gilgo Beach suspects workplace and my previous video was outside his workplace so do go and check that out and i always say going to a scene or going to a location really does paint a million words that you cannot understand from just a picture and i talk about that in my last video so do go and have a look at that and I also just want to say a couple of thank yous. The first thank you is thank you for all my birthday messages. So many of you took time out to wish me a happy birthday over the weekend, and I really appreciate that. Another year and another level in life, notching up wisdom. And I really enjoyed it, spending time with my family. So family time is very important, particularly when you do the type of work that I do. So thank you for all your birthday messages and a huge thank you to everybody who has subscribed to the Crime Analyst YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. And thank you for commenting. Thank you for your super thanks. They, those messages and donations really mean the world to me. And please do keep your comments coming and do share me with other people too. That's how we grow the community. And you know that I am on here because I want to share my knowledge, share everything that I've learned on my journey, 27 years, um, analyzing and working cases and working with victims, but also understanding the psychology of perpetrators. And oftentimes the victims hold up a mirror to the perpetrator. And that's why we should listen to what victims say about what's going on and the psychology is very important to understand the impact of the behavior on the victim but also the psychology of the perpetrator when we think about early identification and intervention and prevention and that's really what i spend most of my time trying to understand the warning signs so that i can put them back out there in a risk model like the dash and also share information on videos like this so with that having been said, I do just want to give a trigger warning. The case that I'm going to be deconstructing today is the murder of Dr. Amy Harwick. And the case is at trial right now. Gareth Peirce House has gone on trial here in Los Angeles for murdering Dr. Amy Harwick and also laying in wait. And the laying in wait part's also important. And that means it can be a death penalty case. So the other important part of this case is that there was a long and detailed documented history. So I'm going to talk through that history because it, we cannot separate out the history from the murder event itself. And I'm going to explain that a little more because I do call cases like Dr. Amy Harwick's a murder in slow motion because it took years for her to be killed and the psychological terror and fear and everything that happened prior the coercive control the stalking is very important that we attend to that that we identify it and we make sure we see it as a pattern we see the macro picture the totality of everything that was happening at the hands of one individual gareth Pursehouse, towards dr amy harwick so let me tell you first of all that Dr. Amy Harwick was a relationships expert and sex therapist here in Los Angeles. She was incredibly popular. She was a very warm and empathetic person. She wanted to help others and that's what she dedicated her life to. So that's important to understand the type of person that Dr. Amy Harwick was. She was super smart. She had a PhD. She had a degree in psychology. And that part of wanting to help people, as you can probably tell, it really chimes with me. And she was very well liked here in Los Angeles. And I know this, a number of her friends contacted me after she was found dead. And I want to just tell you a little bit about that because the night or the early morning that 
Dr. Amy Harwick was found with blunt force trauma to her head and multiple other injuries, by the way, but she was found on the ground beneath her third floor balcony in the early hours. And this was on February the 14th into the 15th, into the early hours in 2020. Now, hopefully most of you are already thinking that that's Valentine's Day, okay? Because date, as well as location, is always very important along with victimology and timeline. You've heard me say that many times, timeline. So she was found and paramedics attended and she wasn't conscious at the time and she died and she died from her injuries, blunt force trauma, but also there was manual strangulation. Now that's very important to understand. What went on prior? Well, her housemate had said that he heard her scream and he heard a struggle and he had actually called 911 and the paramedics and police attended. But let's go back in time because this is such a horrific and brutal murder and I'm calling it a murder in slow motion because of everything that went prior to it so in that night she had been out with friends and some of her girlfriends they had taken pictures and she had come back home and then Gareth Purse house she had found had broken into her house there was a violent struggle she screamed her necklace had come off of her and she well he says fell over the balcony but he strangled her first. And I think the jury will struggle to think that he broke in and there was a violent struggle. He manually strangled her and he didn't kill her. And in particular, just to share with you that there was a syringe that was also found with a lethal dose of nicotine in it. So I'm going to come back to what he's saying as part of his defense. And remember that that's his narrative. But I'm going to look at the facts and the evidence of the case. I'm going to deconstruct what went on prior because I think that that is incredibly important to do. So the first thing to say is that they did have a short relationship, Gareth Pursehouse and Dr. Amy Harwick, and it ended because of his violence and abuse. That shouldn't... Um, well, when people say it ended, she separated because of his violence and abuse. And separation is a high risk factor, particularly when there's coercive control and stalking. And it's a high risk factor for serious harm and femicide. And his behaviour actually just got worse from there on out. But I want to tell you about two restraining orders that Dr. Amy Harwick took out in 2011 and 2012. And I want to read to you what she had written, because like I said, there's a clear documented history. And this is what she wrote in her, in the restraining order under the description of the abuse. She wrote that on the 18th of March, this is in 2012, that he came to her apartment. So I'm gonna quote her. He came to my apartment and smashed 10 picture frames on my door, creating damage to it. He broke into my complex to do this. He created a hazard for the kids in the building. He texted me saying that things will get worse. I called police. On the 19th of March, he broke into my apartment building and left about four dozen flowers taped to my door. On the 20th of March, he broke into my apartment complex and waited outside my door playing music. On the 21st of March, he sent threatening emails to my friends and also to me. OK, so you can see there are a number. I'm not calling them incidents because this is a pattern. There are a number of things that he did breaking into her apartment multiple times. So that means that she knows he can access her. He left flowers there. Well, you can leave flowers or send flowers without you physically being there. And you certainly don't break into someone's apartment building to leave flowers. That's intrusion. And it is deliberately leaving a message that I can get in whenever I choose to. That's the message. He broke into the complex. He stood outside her door with music. So anyone thinking that's romantic, again, that is not romance. This was unwanted behaviour that was frightening 
to Dr. Amy Harwick. It was unwanted behaviour and she made it clear that it was unwanting, unwanted and then he followed it up the next day on the 21st of March, sending threatening emails and messages to her when he doesn't get what he wants. So again, it's very important to understand this power and control pattern. When he doesn't get what he wants, he then threatens her. And this is incredibly frightening behaviour. Now, what happened prior to that was on January the 11th that she said that they had an argument in the car, which progressed to him physically pulling me out of the car. I had a bloody nose from his roughness. He then took my suitcases and threw them overhead very far, damaging them. And she had a bloody nose from that and scratches. So there's another time that she documents saying on May in May 2011, he suffocated me, he punched me, he slammed my head on the ground, he kicked me. This resulted in bruises and an inability to walk, bleeding, broken, broken blood vessels around my face, whiplash and a sore neck and back. So again, these are really serious accounts and I'm not saying allegations, these are very serious accounts of this pattern of behaviour of physical abuse. He also pulled her out of a car on a freeway and left her there. But I want to mention and go back to the choking, the suffocating that she talked about. That is really important that we understand. He suffocated me, she said. He punched me and slammed my head on the ground. He kicked me. The suffocation, any attempt to put the hand over the mouth or hands around the neck, what we know about that is that when male abusers do that to women, they never de-escalate their behaviour, they never go back, they only ever escalate. In fact, it's a high risk factor for serious harm and femicide and it increases the risk sevenfold of serious harm and femicide. That's so important to understand. These are all high risk factors. In fact, I documented more than 11 high risk factors and I want to share them with you. So the physical violence, the fact that he punched her and kicked her and threw her to the ground, slamming her head and the physical abuse that's used to try and control her. That's what it's there for. And him pushing her out of a car on the freeway, really dangerous behaviour. The strangulation and the choking, I've just talked about that. Seven times it increases the risk by. The threats, him messaging her saying that things will get worse. Well, let me share with you that one in two of domestic stalkers, when there's been a relationship, when they make a threat, they act on it. So when there's a threat to kill, we have to take it seriously. One in two, 50%, half. That's why we must take stalking and threats seriously. The victim being in extreme fear, well, Dr. Amy Harwick actually told her friends after she saw him a month before she was killed and they bumped into each other at an awards event and he had a meltdown and I'll tell you about that. But he told her she had, thre she had ruined his life and he called her a bitch. You ruined my life, bitch. And he ended up having a meltdown in a fetal position, lying uh, on the ground, but he was incredibly angry prior to that and caused a real scene and she was terrified. And after that, she said to her friends, if anything happens to me, it's Gareth Purse House. And it's also why she created this documented history, the restraining order. Pieces of paper, in my opinion, don't protect anyone. They're just pieces of paper, but she's trying to do everything possible to keep him away from her. So we must, when a victim is extremely fearful, take that seriously. She was safety planning as well. She tried to do everything possible, target hardening her property to keep her safe, but he broke in. He stalked her. As I said, he broke into her apartment and her house multiple times when she was in her Hollywood house. And he broke in that night. He smashed her photo frames, 10 photo frames. He destroyed those. That's very personal to do that. But he also wiped her computer. Now, why did he wipe her computer? Well, because her computer was important to her. She had documents on there. She was a researcher, uh, a writer. She did uh, therapeutic sessions with people. So 
Her computer was something that really mattered to her and stalkers would damage the thing that really matters to the victim. It's very idiosyncratic behaviour, very targeted. He also had pictures of her, nude pictures of her, which he sent to people. So again, he's using every tool possible to try and control her and close her down and to ruin her at this point. And she did lose some work because of it. He also watched her and he used other people to do that too, friends, who said that they would be used by him to send messages to her, to send music to her, love songs, um, and that he just would not take no for an answer. So these are all the documented high risk factors that I'm sharing with you. Um, the digital and cyber aspect of stalking. Again, people like Purse House, well, they can stalk someone at the touch of a button or via social media. And he was commenting via anonymous accounts on social media and he was terrorizing her online and offline. But also he was a computer programmer. So he could do things like wipe her computer, for example and he had specialist knowledge and skills. He was coercively controlling. He caused property damage. There was separation and finality. She did not want to go back to him. They bumped into each other some, well, a month just before um, she was killed. And he had this melt, he had this meltdown, as I said, but the finality point, and the revenge motive, you ruined my life, bitch, saying these sorts of things. And I wonder whether he is a serial perpetrator. The, the one thing that I'll say is that across my experience of working so many cases, it is incredibly, in fact, I haven't seen it yet, where someone in their fourth decade of life starts behaving like this towards significant women in their life. It normally is a pattern of behaviour because it's about a relational attachment issue, someone not being able to deal with rejection. And I'll, I could say a lot more about that, but I'm going to leave it there, that normally you see a whole pattern of behaviour of this is the way that this person behaves to women in his life when they separate from him. And that's why I've been petitioning for serial domestic abusers and stalkers to be on the same register as sex offenders. They have a pattern of behaviour and that's where we can start to identify them as a problem and trying to intervene and prevent these murders in slow motion. We have to look at their behaviour because someone like Dr Amy Harwick is doing everything possible to keep herself safe and then he breaks into her house and... Well, let's talk about that night because I've shared with you quite a lot of the high risk factors. And I'll also share with you that 76% of domestic violence victims who are murdered, there was a documented history of stalking prior. And when I say documented, it may be their own diary that they kept. It's not always that they report to the police. And I know that from having worked thousands of cases and having set up Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service for these exact cases so that victims have a specialist advocate at their very worst time who can talk with the police and ensure that there is a coordinated criminal justice and civil justice response with the victim's safety at the heart of that response and the perpetrator being risk managed. And like I said, these are these are. Uh, murders in slow motion that I believe are preventable because of this escalation of behaviour. And that night he broke into her house, he lay in wait for her, she returned home, she'd been messaging with friends at about 1am and the police were called I believe at about 1.30. So there's a short window of time, a scream was heard, she struggled with him. He says as part of his defence that she fell over the balcony. Well, women, in my experience, don't fall over their balconies in the middle of the night on Valentine's when their stalker has broken into their apartment and has manually strangled them and has gone there with a syringe full of a lethal dose of nicotine. In my view, he had murder in mind and that's exactly what he did. And yes, that's his defence, but I think the jury are going to be hard pushed to understand this whole documented history and that he broke in there. He went to great lengths and he manually strangled her. That was found in the autopsy and that somehow she fell over the balcony. It just doesn't happen like that. And 
That's why it's so important that pattern and experts are used in court to talk about that pattern of behaviour. So as I mentioned, some of her friends contacted me in 2020 after this happened and they started a petition called Justice for Amy where I talked with them about including the register for serial stalkers. I talked with them about coercive control and criminalising it here. So important that we understand that coercive control correlates significantly with femicide. And we are talking about male violence here. So this is all being played out at court at the moment. There have been a number of attempts to declare a mistrial by his defence team. Um, but I think given this clear documented history and the fact that um, you cannot separate out this pattern from what he did, that stalking is about fixation and obsession and intrusive behaviour. And it is all there. And we know that in America, four to five women are murdered by their former or current male partner. This is a huge issue and it's on you know, a much bigger scale that Dr. Amy Harwick was someone who was well known in Los Angeles, but there are also people who are not famous who were stalked as well. And that's exactly why we need something like Paladin here, a National Stalking Advocacy Service, and one specifically in Los Angeles to help victims where you have trained specialist advocates and a helpline for victims because it is absolutely terrifying when you're being stalked and it's this war of attrition it wears you down and it wears you out you're fighting for survival but you're also fighting a system that doesn't understand the behaviors and oftentimes the stalking is about the psychological terror and fear the, the stalking and the stalker's behaviour engenders. So the fact that he was breaking into her property is terrifying, particularly if you're a single woman who lives alone. And yet the police might say, well, we can't prove that it was him. So and because they don't tend to be proactive in their investigation, they say, well, we can't prove it. And as I always say, you cannot prove it if you do nothing. You do have to proactively investigate and ensure a proactive response. So I'm going to leave it there. I could talk for much longer, but I just wanted to give a very clear account of this pattern of behaviour. The reason why I deconstruct murders backwards to understand that pattern of events and create risk models like the DASH. Do look at the DASH risk checklist website. And if you're being stalked, please don't suffer in silence. Please reach out and get support and help from a trained specialist. So you can look at Paladin's website, for example, um, paladinservice.co.uk. There's advice that, that you can take away there. Um, I always use the acronym, acronym REPORT. Do report it to a police, the R. Do ensure that you get um, good advice and that you collect the evidence. So the E is for evidence collection. And the P is get good practical advice from a specialist. And the O is keep a diary, an overview of the time date stamp of what happened and how it made you feel, the impact of that behaviour. And the R is risk assess. Risk assess yourself. Use the Dash Risk Checklist website. There's a separate 12 questions on there for stalking. Any type of stalking or stalker, you can use that and take it to the police with you once you've completed it. And the T is for trust your instinct. As I always say, always trust your instinct. And that's what I'm going to end with. I'm going to end with thinking about Dr. Amy Harwick and I really want to see justice for Amy and accountability in this case. And I really want to see the register come in for these serial perpetrators who are incredibly dangerous when they are fixated and obsessed and they want revenge. These are power and control cases, power and control crimes. So I'm going to end thinking about Dr. Amy Harwick and her family. And I hope that there is justice and accountability in this case. And I'll end with what I always say, be curious, ask questions and always trust your instinct.